Uh, welcome and welcome back anybody who's been here for the whole series or um, has dropped in and out throughout the series. I'm Christine Valenza Shin, class of 84 and Senior Associate Director for Advising and Programs in Beyond Barnard, which you all probably knew as career services or career development, um, depending on how long ago you graduated. So uh, welcome to everyone. And before we get officially started, the usual uh, reminder that we are recording this um, for archiving, and uh, but you are um, neither your voice nor your image will appear in the recording. Um, and but you can participate by writing um, questions in the question and answer section, um, and uh, other comments or technical issues can go in the chat section. Um, and you can either share that with everyone or you can share it with just the admin. So we'll get started. And actually, I want to start by thanking my colleague, Lacey Beck, also an alum. I don't know if I've mentioned that before, class of 14, who works in development and alumni relations and has been the organizer behind this and my co-host throughout this. And she's done an amazing job. It's been great to work with her. And so I want to give her a shout out for everything she's done through this summer long presentation series of presentations. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get started on our session for today. There we go. And present. Excellent. So, a companion in some ways to last week's session, which was called Know Your Worth and was about negotiating. This is the uh, a counterpart to that, which is growing your worth once you're uh, in a new position or in your current position. How can you continue to maximize your worth, your value added, your satisfaction, your skill set, all of those good things. Um, and so we're taking a look today at how you can manage your ongoing professional development once you're in a job or if you're staying put for the time being. So our final reminder that this series is part of Beyond Barnard Summer Colloquium. It was a brand new thing that we launched this summer in this summer of COVID um, and trying to fill in some of the void uh, left by canceled internships, postponed job offers, as well as the uh, employment um, issues that many, many of our whether you actually lost your job or are in between things or are still employed but, but looking ahead. So thank you again for participating and for being part of this summer long conversation. Oops. And our last mental health image, again, fancy with the, with the moving parts. Um, but again, we're looking at nature we're taking a deep breath and reminding ourselves that there are things going on outside of our immediate day-to-day -day concerns. So we're actually gonna start, we're gonna repeat the poll I did in the very first session. Uh, so Lacey's gonna launch that. And I'm just curious to sort of revisit where you're at in terms of your current employment status and your current job seeking status. So let me give you a second to fill that out. Almost everybody has voted. Okay, I'm going to end, just give you a couple more seconds. Anybody else else to? Oh, good. Okay. Excellent. And then let's go ahead and share results. 
Great. Okay. So we've got 26% employed full time, 14% employed part time. No hired and one other. Interesting. All right, good. So similar to how we started, I think we had a bigger group that very first session eight weeks ago or seven weeks ago. Um, so, but uh, helpful to know that, um, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, you know, sort of where to, where to fit this session into the context. All right, and then looking at job seeking, let's see where people are at. Oops. How do I scroll down on this? Oh, there we go. Okay. So we've got a number of people passively looking, the largest percentage, 63% actively looking for a new or additional job. And then some of you still in the planning phases and a couple of you thinking, thinking ahead. So, all right, good to know. Good to know both for me and for, for all of us where, where we're at. And I'll tell you why I wanted to revisit that poll um, in talking a little bit just about where we're at. You know, eight weeks later, we, Oh, it's hard to remember exactly where we where we were big picture, but back in June, still uh, in this in the northeast area, starting to reopen, um, pri and then just the beginnings of the brewings of the uh, pandemic getting worse in many many other parts of the country. So, um, and now of course we've got school restarting from higher ed all the way down to preschool and all of those issues. So lots has been going on while we've been checking in every week on, on this type of thing. But I like to, I added this session to the series a couple years ago um, because uh, I used to actually do it together with the negotiating, but it started to get squished. And I thought, you know, it's a good optimistic place to end the series on because uh, it assumes as we have throughout that you will in fact end up with a new job, a new position. And so it looks a little bit ahead. So, um, so for a lot of you, uh, as we found from the poll, you are thinking ahead to when you get your new job. And that's a lot of what the suggestions today are going to be aimed at. But I did want to point out that, um, that for those of you who aren't actively looking um, or who are facing a, um, you know, a long job search while you are still currently employed, um, that, you know, the, there's a lot of things that um, you can be doing, you know, from this list of suggestions we're going to make today, um, you know, to be, you know, continue to position yourself as strongly as possible um, should the interview start coming in, should more jobs and more opportunities start to open up. Um, over the next few months as we continue to, to weather this uh, really tough public health crisis and, and of course, really serious economic crisis. Um, and then obviously also aimed at, at anybody in any of the categories, um, you know, to help you expand your options as you can keep in mind your long-term goals. Um, you know, we've been talking all summer to people individually, to students, to groups of alumni about sort of in this moment of crisis, balancing your short term, short term goals, short term needs with your longer term plans that might have been in place for a while or might have been evolving. Um, so, so hopefully a lot of the suggestions that I make today will apply to people in a variety of situations. So, um, so yeah, so most of the sides are going to be aimed primarily at, you know, those of you anticipating your next job. And then once you're settled into that job, you know, what can you be doing to keep an eye on the future? Um, so always worth saying that, you know, your number one task when you start a new job is to concentrate on learning to do that job well. And again, this idea of growing your worth, increasing your value, you know, you want to learn to do the good, learn to do the job well, <clears throat> use resources, et cetera, so that you're, um, you know, getting the most out of the job, contributing the most to the organization or the company, and then setting yourself up for those longer term goals. But they, the, I guess my main point today is that once you do settle into the job and, and, and are feeling, feeling more comfortable and, you know, continuing to learn, but you know, does not, not being bombarded as, as it can sometimes feel those few, few couple of weeks and months as you um, adjust to a new position that you do think about, um, you know, back to the longer term, you know, and how can you in within this job continue to grow professionally and continue to pay attention to your <coughs> individual overall career development. And the idea is, um, you know, with any new job, whether by choice or not, is you're trying to position yourself, as it says here in the final final bullet, for your own satisfaction and success and, you know, possible future opportunities, whether it's within that same organization or um, somewhere else. 
So what we're using for the agenda today actually is sort of recapping the whole series. Um, so um, the idea is to go back over some of what some of the topics we've been talking about in this context of looking ahead and, and continuing to make these part of your lives even when even once you're not actively seeking a job anymore but are in fact in a job so we didn't do a whole separate section on career exploration but we did touch on it at the at the beginning of the uh, job search um, opening webinar because it's always an important always important any job search to stop and, and take a, at least a few minutes a few hours couple days to think about what you're exploring, what other options could be out there. Uh, and then I'll make note of some of these other things. A lot of this is um, suggestions based on my experience, based on um, ideas I've stolen from Barnard colleagues, um, and then from, you know, sort of multiple resources, just, you know, ideas of how people manage this and, um, and sort of are able to keep, keep an eye on long-term career development and not just on the day-to-day, -day, which I think is particularly difficult um, in times like this when the day-to-day -day has become different and in many ways much harder to navigate than it, than it was in sort of more normal times, whatever normal means. So. so yeah, so let's start with career. Uh, we'll, we'll focus a little on career exploration and just a couple of suggestions for how to keep this part of your life, even when you're settling into a new job or feeling, okay, here's where I'm at for now. Um, I think that question, which we talked about at that point, that sweet spot of what you most enjoy and are most skilled at um, is something you want to look at, you know, so again, once you've settled into the job or as you're, you know, staying in your current job for now, um, what do you love? How much of a part of your day is that? Is there a way to make that, you know, a bigger part of your day? Often, not always, um, you have opportunities through work to go to, you know, professional development or career development workshops, uh, take an assessment. Um, you know, so the idea, I, I, I'll use the term consider a lot. Um, you don't always have to say automatically yes, but, but you also, you want to avoid saying automatically no to things. And, you know, sometimes these workshops and assessments can feel uncomfortable, touchy-feely, you know, and sometimes they can be handled not particularly well by your employer. So obviously you want to sort of get a sense of what's, what's going to happen. But I think that um, they can be really helpful. Um, I've done a number of them around Barnard for other departments, you know, where we've done, for instance, there's a version of the Myers-Briggs, uh, it's called a team report. Um, and so everyone takes the Myers-Briggs type indicator and then you uh, profile not, I mean, you do profile the individuals or you share that information with them, but you profile the department as a whole and do some exercises to talk about um, how that works. And I know that, um, you know, a lot of workplaces will use DISC and um, there's a colors one. Um, there's a number of different assessments out there that are used can be used both one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, and, and sort of for your individual growth, but also for team growth. And I think that, um, you know, it's helpful to, to jump in on those if can, if you can. And then if any of you are, have done the assessments um, this summer or in the recent past or are planning in the, to, to do the assessments through us, um, it can also be helpful to just keep those, keep those in mind, pull them out, take a look at, and remind yourself, again, some of your strengths, some of your challenges, um, some of the, the different things that you identified and interest in and, and uh, can think about bringing into your work if possible. Um, and then just on a, a sort of time management or re reminder point of view, um, queuing, I'll, I'll mention this a couple times throughout the presentation, but queuing this to performance review time or other transition points in the year. So it could be the end of the fiscal year or the calendar year if those two are different, but, you know, or it, it could be as simple as just putting a note on your calendar, you know, to, um, you know, calling it whatever you want, you know, career exploration or some of the other suggestions I make. But it's not like, you know, the reality is that you're not going to pay a ton of attention to these on a day-to-day -day basis, but you do want to remind yourself to occasionally check in and, and keep that, that longer term, bigger picture in mind. of career exploration that we talked about very briefly at the beginning of the series the the assessments are sort of about looking inward and 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 you know in the case of your team looking a little outward the other part of this is workforce research what's going on you know out in your field so you know just a, these these suggestions should look familiar from some of the series but it's just reminding you that linkedin is not just for when you're looking for jobs um, 
again, you know, similarly with ONET and the Occupational Outlook Handbook, um, you know, you can look, think about your broader field, or if you are still in the long term considering making a switch, you know, it can be helpful to just remind yourself of that when you're in the middle of, you know, learning to do a job well, or just simply, you know, doing the job on a day to day basis, which can be super time consuming. So. And depending on your manager, if you've got a good supportive manager, um, you know, just don't forget, again, to ask about opportunities. You know, if you find out about something or you can ask them to let you know about, you know, opportunities for skill building or outside, you know, outside resources that um, may well be paid for by the company or organization. So. So then let's talk a little bit about resumes, LinkedIn profile and cover letters. And I promise you they, you know, will stop being part of your daily existence for which I'm sure many of you will be glad. Um, but you do, you don't want to forget about them completely. So just a couple of tips here um, on, you know, pulling these up and, and updating them. And when I say updating regularly, I'm not talking about every day or every week or even every month, but just again, schedule in, you know, um, a couple times a year, or once a year, um, or it could be related to particular content, but you just, you wanna pull it up every once in a while, especially your LinkedIn profile. Um, as soon as you're comfortable adding your new position to LinkedIn, it's a great, it's a great way of sort of, you know, announcing, you know, that you've, you've made the switch, you've got a new role. Um, people that helped you along the way will be happy to hear that and you'll get a lot of good congratulations. Um, so you do not have to do it the day you get the offer or the day you start, you certainly can wait, wait a little bit, you know, um, but definitely update LinkedIn. And while you're at it, if you're adding it to LinkedIn, do a quick cut and paste plunk it into your uh, everything or master resume so um, so that you've made made a note of it. Um, and then as you go along, you know, if you are given a new role or you take on a special project, you know, it uh, doesn't hurt to, you know, take a few minutes to jot down a few new bullets, um, add them to your, uh, add them to your everything but the kitchen sink resume is a, is a new suggestion I got for what to call, uh, what we were calling the master resume when we first talked about this. Um, and then it, just a, a reminder, this can be paper or electronic, but keeping a file with things like your professional bio, um, performance reviews, and then, you know, if you get an email from a manager, a colleague, a client saying something nice about you, uh, save it, you know, um, at the very least, it's fun to pull up that file on your computer or pull out a paper file and read nice things about yourself. Um, and from a very pragmatic point of view, it can help give you fodder for the self-evaluation you might have to write as part of your performance review. Or if you do start, um, you know, sending out cover letters in a future job search, you've got some concrete things. Um, and I was thinking as well, you know, we talked a lot when we talked about cover letters about being more narrative, more storytelling. Um, so when something uh, happens, when a story story happens, um, you know, where you, you know, are pleased with how you did or had to handle an unexpected curveball, you know, um, or just, you know, sort of feel good about the job you did and, and, and how good you are at your job. Jot that down, you know, try and, you know, as a, as a memory thing, even if you, even if you're not going to write a cover letter for another three years, it can be helpful to have that in. Um, and again, cueing this to if you're working someplace where there is an annual performance review process, but uh, not every place has that. So it could be, you know, um, you know, just other natural point, uh, you know, during during the year to to think about doing this and checking in on these. So now we're going to talk a little bit to, to spend a little bit more time on networking as you'll see, um, because of course, you know, as we talked about when we talked about networking, the people you work with, the people you used to work with are, can be a very strong part of your um, network, both in the moment and of course in the, in the future, being able to tap, you know, former managers, former colleagues, even former people that you supervised can be really helpful. So, so building those relationships while you are in the job is, is really important. So, in terms of online, um, again, you want to not completely forget about LinkedIn. Keep it part of your routine, hopefully much less frequently than during your job search. Um, but you can continue to add contacts. Um, 
generally speaking, you know, you don't need to run right out the first day that you're there and, and add all of your colleagues. Some people, you know, add their colleagues sparingly or uh, slowly and gradually. You know, you can wait and see who's who and who you click with and who you feel like things are going well with. Um, you know, you don't, there's no rule that you have to add anybody you work with uh, to your, um, to your LinkedIn connections, but it is, uh, you know, it's, it's frequent and depending on your profession. I mean, as a career advisor, we, you know, I'm basically connected to everybody on my immediate team and, and a lot of people throughout Barnard and a lot of my former colleagues. And, and that's really, you know, really helpful, you know, to have that network and sort of keep an eye on what people are doing and what people are saying. So, um, so yeah, and a lot of, you know, the rest of the bullets are things, um, you know, we already talked about in terms of managing that ongoing relationship. So keep those things in mind. And then as, uh, especially if you've made a shift to a different kind of organization or a different sector or a different role, uh, you know, it's a good question. Keep your eyes and ears open. Are there other social media platforms that your industry uses, you know, that uh, you might want to, you know, dip a toe in or become, become comfortable with? So in terms of live or in person, um, again, assuming that, you know, we will actually be able to uh, you know, be in the same room with people, be, uh, go to lunch again someday, uh, you know, some, some suggestions about in person, or again, if, if the remote work continues, um, you know, for as long as some places are saying it's going to, you know, this can be done virtually, but live, you know, so we're talking about live interactions. And of course, the phone always exists. So, um, so that first point that never eat lunch alone comes from a, a, a very early, very early in my, uh, sort of career development days, I attended a workshop where somebody, you know, with great authority said, you should never eat lunch alone. Uh, it was specifically on networking. So for somebody like me who uses lunch to regroup a little, especially after advising all day or presenting a lot or being in meetings all day, that seems a little daunting, which is why I modify the advice to, you know, what's comfortable. But I think the impulse is a good one, which is that, you know, spending some social time um, with colleagues, you know, um, with colleagues that you like and, you know, connect with, with colleagues you don't know that well, but, you know, um, you work together on similar projects, etc. you know, um, think about, you know, again, making this part of your routine it does not have to be every day or even every week, but maybe once a month you reach out and, and try and connect with someone. In these remote days, maybe it just means, you know, having a cup of tea um, at the same time while you chat on Zoom, if you can stand being on Zoom, or maybe it's, uh, I've, I've been finding, especially outside of work, I am so tired of Zoom that just a good old fashioned phone call, you know, but, um, you know, just scheduling that time to chat, um, yeah, or even spontaneously can be, can be nice. So, um, often when you come on board, you'll receive invitations, whether you're in person or remote. And, and so, you know, um, definitely take people up on that. And then as newer colleagues come on board, you can, you can be the inviter in return. Um, I always like to add this final point that, it, you know, in, even without COVID in this day and age, it is possible, even at a small place like Barnard, relatively small place like Barnard, you can go weeks or months or years corresponding with somebody across campus and yet never actually meet them in person. Um, so this is basically a little reminder of like, hey, if you're going to, if you're going to email every month with the person in budgeting or somebody in one of the academic departments, why not hop on the phone one day instead of emailing or why not, um, you know, stop by their office um, if you're, if you are physically there and just, you know, say, hey, just wanted to see your face, meet you in person. Thank you for all of your help, et cetera. Uh, and then there's a lot of networking opportunities, formal and informal within organizations. So, you know, if you're working someplace teeny tiny, uh, <laughs> there may not be, uh, it's just one happy network, um, but in uh, medium to larger organizations, uh, there often are existing networks or affinity groups, um, you know, so whether it's around gender or race or, um, other facets of, you know, uh, sexual identity, you know, gender identity, there's a, there, there often are existing networks or affinity groups within the organization. Um, 
also, I mean, I, I come from higher ed, so there's always committees, there's always task forces, um, but this happens certainly across the nonprofit sector and in the private sector as well. So again, consider, you know, don't, don't do the automatic no, even if you're feeling busy, you know, take a minute to think about it and say, oh, you know, that could be an interesting committee to be on, that could be an interesting problem to address. Um, all of these are not only resume builders per se, but they're an opportunity to meet people from across the organization. So Barnard created a, what's called the Barnard staff um, uh, advisory council a few years back and uh, I was invited to join and I found it really helpful. It's been a lot of extra work on top of an already busy job but I've met and worked with people from across the college that I otherwise wouldn't have met and it's uh, really sort of strengthened those ties and you know kept me kept me aware of what's going on across campus not just in our, our little corner. So um, and then there's a whole world, you know, people, there's a lot of people who do formal or informal groups. Again, I think this is a little harder to do uh, with people working remotely, but, um, but not impossible. And, and then certainly, hopefully, we'll all, you know, um, have at least some in-person opportunities at some point. Um, there used to be a, a, I used to call, I wasn't part of it, but uh, from the outside, I used to call it the power knitting group at Barnard, which uh, if some of you remember Dean Dorothy Denberg, I believe she was the force behind this. And I believe it was once a week or once every other week, just a small group of people who knitted or quilted or did other handcrafting would gather in her office. And, um, you know, she was obviously pretty high up in the organization, as was, I think, the director of the budget and finance was in that group um, at that time. So, you know, that's a, that's, you know, an, an interesting, interesting model. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot got talked about and a lot of that, you know, informal uh, planning and, and things like that that happened uh, in networking situations happened. Um, and then I had another colleague uh, uh, quite a few years back who uh, became a mom while she, at the time, while she worked at Barnard and started a group. I think they only managed to meet once a month because they were in fact working moms, but, uh, you know, so it was mostly, you know, it was a group of, uh, of administrators across the campus who had very young children at home and, and they just got together once a month to have lunch and chat about challenges and I think a little bit of collective action came about and a, for instance, a, a nursing room, um, a, a more accessible nursing room came out of that group. Um, so um, yeah, so it's something to think about. Um, and actually that same friend uh, who has since moved on, a uh, friend and colleague, she was somebody who introduced me to this idea, which is to request an informational interview with, with higher up. She specifically was on the sort of student and programming side of things, and, but was very interested in the operation side of the college and learning about budgeting and finance and um, you know some of that part. And so she scheduled a, an, an appointment with our uh, CFO at the time and, and had a nice conversation about the college as a whole, but also, you know, higher ed and things like that. So it, it, this can be tricky. You have to navigate your own manager and, uh, you know, check in advance or make sure this isn't going to be, you know, uncomfortable. But I think it's a, again, I, I learned a lot from that particular colleague about, uh, you know, some of this uh, networking and self-advocacy, you know, um, and paying attention to that stuff uh, in addition to the day-to-day. -day. So, and then of course, you know, we're all part of our fields whether it's a field we're staying in or a field that we're looking to navigate out of or into, into a new one. Um, we're all familiar with, you know, almost most, most professions have conferences, but I often do the same thing. I forget about the uh, smaller chapters, the, you know, the shorter, uh, closer uh, versions of the big annual conference. So something to, to take a look at. And I think I mentioned volunteering for professional organizations a couple of times when we talked about networking. Um, there's lots of Barnard groups that I mentioned during the networking, um, but you also can start a group if there isn't a, if there isn't a Barnard club in your region or if there hasn't been a gathering for a while, you can reach out to alumni relations. You can uh, reach out to Beyond Barnard about some of the more professional uh, oriented ones. So, um, and then if some of you may have gotten our annual call for volunteers for our various mentoring and career related programming last year. Uh, the email went out yesterday and it's for the coming year. Um, mentoring, um, even when you feel like you could use a mentor yourself, uh, also having a mentee uh, can really, it, it's a really helpful way of uh, connecting and sort of, again, going back to the title, growing your worth, uh, talking about your job, giving advice about your field. They can really help you, again, keep this sort of career development, you know, kind of uh, front of front of mind. 
uh, meetups. I feel like meetups, um, you know, the online platform, I feel like I still I see people using that more for hobbies and, and activities, but, um, but I think there still are, are, you know, work and professional networking things that are used. And I'm sure there's even more uh, popular and recent online facilitators as well. So keeping those in mind. So yeah, so quite a few networking tips there. And, and is this a good time to say that I don't expect you, nobody expects you to do all of this. And a lot of this presentation today is just a, a gathering, a recap of suggestions that have been made earlier and a gathering of some new uh, new suggestions through the lens of how can you, you know, um, keep some of this going once you're, once you're settled in your new job. Let's continue with some of these tips for job search, interviewing and negotiating. So I get this question actually, you know, a fair amount, you know, somebody will say, I just started a job, but I'm already looking at other things, you know, and it could be because they're still in the habit, you know, of looking at opportunities because they've been doing it for a while, or it could be that, you know, could be growing pains in the new job, or it could be the reality that it's not a great fit. And so you already want to start looking, but whatever, even if you're perfectly happy um, and aren't planning on going anywhere for a year or two or five, uh, it can be helpful to see what's out there uh, and just sort of keep yourself apprised of, of the situation. Um, so, you know, again, there's in no way am I suggesting that you actively be looking at job sites, but again, if you can occasionally take a look um, or it, you know, one of the things we talked about with networking is having that working list of places you'd love to work for. Um, so, you know, it can't hurt to take an occasional look and see, see what's up there. I mean, if this is the kind of thing that's going to drive you crazy, um, then don't do this too often, but it, it, it is helpful to just, it's, it's part of kind of keeping an eye on what's going on professionally and, and, and across your field. And that can be really helpful as we, as we all sort of tend to stay hunkered down in our, our own company, our own team. Um, and then, you know, some of you, a lot of you may hear through connections or recruiters about other possibilities. And, and I encourage you, you don't have to, it doesn't sound like a good thing, or if you're super busy doing other things, or it just feels too soon, you can certainly don't have to, but it, it is okay to take a look and at least maybe go, you know, have a chat or a preliminary interview and, and um, see, see if you might be interested, see if they might be interested. You can always improve your interview skills. Um, we're actually, we're just putting together an event in September that we're gonna invite alumni as well as students to about interviewing skills. Um, and it can never hurt, we can all get better at that. So um, especially as you start a new job, you're going to meet a lot of new people. So keep, uh, keep working on that 30 second pitch that we've developed and talked about in the networking um, session. And then I probably learned more about how interviewing works by being on interview committees than, than I learned from anything else from, you know, being interviewed or um, reading about resources, but it really helps you see it from the other side that only improves you as a candidate. So, um, and then, uh, you know, even though for a lot of people, public speaking is not their favorite thing. Um, if you're asked to present small group, large group, um, you know, think about, think seriously about saying yes, don't automatically say no. Um, and if you really struggle in that area or struggle in your confidence, uh, there can be workshops, there can be other, um, you know, other opportunities to improve. So take them if you can. And on the negotiation front, I think, you know, it should, uh, you just don't want to stop doing some of what maybe you've started doing, you know, uh, during the series, during your job search, which is, which is to continue to gather salary information. There actually, I think there's going to be a fair amount of, you know, press and ongoing media coverage about salaries, equity in salaries, the impact of COVID on salaries. So, you know, keep reading, um, keep talking to people, um, especially, you know, could be at work, it could be outside of work, but, but when you get the chance to, to get a nugget of information, you know, gather it, write it down. Um, and you can be the change agent as well. You can be the one who brings it up diplomatically or otherwise. Um, and then, as we talked about last week, you want to uh, think about when is your next opportunity to negotiate? When is your next opportunity to ask for more of what you need to do your job well? So, all right, so just a couple of final thoughts and then we'll leave some time for Q&A. 
this comes from a, a, a course I took down at NYU when I was uh, getting a career advising certificate down there. And uh, I think she had a really nice graphic for this. I just turned it back into a simple list, but I, it really had an impact on me um, because a lot, of, a lot of career stuff, a lot of advising stuff is about what can you control and what can't you control. So really when it comes to work, we have the most control over those two key things. And they're very much focused on ourselves, right? We control to a large extent our performance, right? Not always. External factors there. And also, as we've been talking about, you know, for the last half hour, you also have a fair amount of control of your professional development. You know, what else do you want to learn? <coughs> what skills do you want to add? So the message, of course, is to concentrate on these. These other things that you have less control over, right? Um, your title can change. Your job description can change officially or unofficially. Uh, when I first started at uh, Barnard in this role, I came back thinking I would be working for um, my uh, a former colleague um, who, was, who I reported to, and she got another job at another college a couple months later, and I had a brand new manager who was also lovely, but much younger than myself and super uncomfortable managing me. And, uh, you know, it was a, you know, it was an adjustment um, it, completely outside my control. I was not given any say in it. Um, so, and I'm sure all of you have had similar experiences from time to time. Um, similarly, your company can make all sorts of decisions. Your organization can make all sorts of decisions that you're, you're, you don't have a strong part of, but that can really have a big impact on your job. Certainly industries are impacted and the economy, as we all know. So, um, so it's not to say that you don't think about these things, that you don't try and, you know, advocate for yourself and exert pressure and use what power you do have um, over some of these, but, but recognizing it's, it's, it's sort of being realistic and saying, all right, uh, I can be frustrated, I can be angry, I can be excited about these outside factors, but what can I actually do about them? You know, and sort of focus on that and then make sure you remember the parts that you do have a lot of control over, which is your performance, your professional development. So. Hopefully you'll find that. I, I find that a helpful thing to think about. Not everybody will. And then a final thought here. So the idea here is there will always be change. There will always be the unexpected. And I don't need to give you proof of that because we're all sitting right here in this particular moment dealing with the unexpected every single day. But the, and, and a lot of that can feel negative, but some of that can be positive as well. Um, and the idea is that when the change comes, positive, negative, or mix, that you will be better off if you've been paying a little bit of attention to this uh, as, you, as you go through this process. You're trying to give yourself options so that if you are laid off or if the company is bought or if, you know, higher ed is completely transformed in the next five years, <laughs> that you will be in a better position to sort of be flexible, be creative, manage, make it work for you and, and give yourself options. So the series is over. I debated whether to put a happy face, sad face or a combo, right? Um, it's, been, it's been a pleasure and I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, but just encouraging you all to, I believe there's going to be a survey next week about the whole summer colloquium. So please feel free to you know, check off and, and give us feedback on anything you participated in. We are really, Locally, and we're always interested in feedback on new programs, and then also uh, we want to hear from you about what other topics uh, you might be interested in. So you can always communicate either those to me, either to me directly um, or to beyond Barnard at barnard.edu. Some of you have already started spreading the wealth with your fellow alumni. Please feel free to continue sending them the link uh, to the recordings. Um, and I'd also would love to hear from, um, even if you haven't uh, followed up with an advising appointment, um, if any of you, any updates you care to share, if you get a job, if you get an interview, if you have a negotiating question, shoot me an email and let me know. 
Uh, as always, you can make an advising appointment now or later. I'm going to first put a plug in for the rest of my amazing advising team. Uh, you all met Alexa as well. Those of you who were in on the interviewing session met my colleague Alexa, also an alumna, um, and she is a uh, excellent advisor, I'd say, you know, she, she loves advising and coaching people to get them ready for interviews, which is why I had her do that session. Um, any of you thinking about law school, she's also uh, been doing some additional training over the last year or so and, and really grown her expertise in that area. Uh, and she also used to <clears throat> work on the HR side of things. So she's got a lot of insight into negotiating and the hiring process. So she's, she's a great person to follow up with. Uh, my colleague, Lindsay Granger Weaver, is a Columbia College graduate, uh, class of 06. She worked at Columbia Career Services. She's worked uh, in a number of different programs uh, across the country, and she's been here at Barnard uh, coming up on, it's been a year and a half, uh, two years. So she's also a really uh, strong advisor. She presented this year, this summer on career exploration. She loves talking to people about that process. Um, and she also managed our series on the school to work transition. So for those of you who are early days and, and maybe adjusting or, or searching for your first job, she could be a great person to talk to. Uh, and then Brianna Roman is the other person on my team. And she, she's been working really closely with uh, some of our alumni who worked who work at LinkedIn on developing uh, some LinkedIn workshops. So she's become sort of our in-house expert um, on a lot of the ins and outs of LinkedIn. So she's a great person to talk to as well. And she, of, of the four of us, I think she the most loves editing resumes. Um, so she's a great person to think about as well. And then outside of our team, Greg Triandis is my fellow senior associate director. He runs the um, uh, employer relations part of our shop and uh, has a background in finance. So he He's a, a great person to talk to. He also gives a great mock interview um, because he sat in on so many of them before. So, um, so all of which is to say we're heading into our busy season. Um, I'm off next week. Um, and then when I come back, we are starting to train our peer career advisors and participate in orientation and get all the students back on campus and help them find internships. And so you may find it's a little hard to get an appointment one-on-one -on -one with me over the next couple of weeks. If you can wait, I'm happy to talk to any of you individually, but if you can't wait, please consider uh, one of my other colleagues who can equally take care of you and support you and provide you with resources. And um, yeah, so we're, we're here here for the appointments. Um, and then again, always, uh, if something's time sensitive, reach out to me. And if I don't get back to you right away, reach out to me again. And, uh, you know, we have a little bit of flexibility over our schedule. So, all right. So uh, there's my email address, if you haven't noted it yet. And there's Beyond Barnard's email address. Those are the best ways to get in touch with us. And let's handle some questions. I'm going to stop sharing. And great. All right, so we've got, um, looks like both the chat and the Q&A have things in them. Let's start with the Q&A. All right, so at some point, it would be helpful for you to address how women who have trained, have experience in multiple areas, disciplines can focus a job search without foreclosing opportunities for which they're qualified. Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, uh, in this time period, particularly where people are trying to be flexible, um, I think I talk about this sometimes when I do a career exploration, um, which is that I think the goal is to sort of narrow it down to two, max three possible paths. And then at that point, make a decision. Do you want to pursue these um, simultaneously? Uh, in which case, you just need to come up with a simple system for that. You know, does that mean you're checking everything every day? Does it mean that you just have a simple system where today I'm going to focus on these jobs, these job postings, tomorrow I'm going to focus on those? Um, the reason I say max three is I feel like beyond three, it, 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 you know, three sort of general areas, it can be really difficult to keep a job search going in, in all those, all those areas. So, um, but yeah, I think that it is possible. I think, you know, you know yourself better than I do, but if you can keep three things in mind, three possible paths, three fields, three roles, uh, definitely do that. The other, um, the other way of approaching this when I work with somebody one-on-one -on -one is to have them rank them, you know, where would you most like to get a job? What do you want to focus your attention on initially? Um, and so then again, it's kind of a, 
I tend to look at this from a practical time management point of view, um, is making sure, um, you know, just prioritize that. So give it more hours a day, give it more days a week, right? But don't forget about those other possible areas, right? Um, and, uh, you know, and so make sure you're checking in there. So if you have, a, for instance, a specific niche job site for a particular role that you, you have experienced in the past, <laughs> Um, it might not be your top priority, but you would consider it, um, you know, keep an eye on that as well. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's tough. It's tough to focus a job search, but I think, I think one of those two methods of either pra sort of pragmatically figuring out how you can keep two or three balls in the air, or how can you prioritize and then when do you shift the focus? So for instance, in, in a market such as today's, you may focus for a couple of weeks on the area you're most interested in. You might find out relatively quickly there's not a lot happening. You're not seeing a lot of postings. You're not getting a lot of back from your network. You're not getting nibbles on your resume cover letter. And so you might put that one on the back burner and focus on one area that's maybe you know uh, happening a little bit more. So. Um, for the assessments provided by the college, are there costs associated with them or are they free to alumni? So we do charge uh, $15 each for the two assessments that we manage, which is the Strong Interest Inventory and the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. Uh, you could take one or both. Um, and uh, as I said, it's $15 fee. If that, if that $15 or $30 represents, you know, it, it's just impossible for you in that moment, then absolutely, you know, let us know and we can sometimes waive that. But we are, I mean, obviously Barnard, like everyone else, is facing a, a huge budget crunch. So, um, so yeah, so it, uh, there is a charge. We hope it's manageable and we'll talk to you if it's not. What's your view of the value of applying to job openings on site if you don't have a relationship with the company? I would go ahead. I, my criteria for applying to a job is, uh, if you read through the job description and there's something about the job that's compelling, it doesn't have to be perfect, but there's something compelling that some part of it seems appealing to you or even just the overall company um, or organization seems, um, you know, then that's great. That means you should read the job description a second time. And this time the question is, can I put together a case for hiring me, right? Um, the reason I say to do those for things separately is uh, what I find, especially working with all you Barnard women, um, is that you tend to go to that first part first um, and read it sort of critically and, you know, like, oh, there's no way I can do that part. There's no way I can do that part. I can't show that part, you know, the sort of negative reading of it. Not everybody, but there is a tendency to be very analytical. Um, so I, I, I try and get people to read it first. I say perfectly selfishly. Um, just look at it from a purely selfish point of view. Does this appeal to me? Does some part of this compel me to apply? Then analytically, can I put together a case and then and then go for it? And then follow these best practices we've been talking all through the series. You know, customize the resume, focus on achievements, write an interesting cover letter that shows you in action. Um, <clears throat> you know, prep for that interview. Give the strongest interview you can. So, um, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't. The networking part is very strong and it's going to be stronger um, during a tough job market. So, you know, if you're going to spend more time on one or the other, yes, more on applying to things where you have a connection or where you've been given the job lead, but don't ignore the open market um, where you might not have a relationship with the company because a strong application um, can jump you, jump you into that smaller pile and get you an interview. So definitely. Is it a bad idea to apply for multiple jobs at the same company? That's an interesting one. The, um, uh, it's, it's all about finding a balance. So I would say um, if it's a company you're super interested in, but the job isn't that interesting, you might want to hold off for a day or two or even a week to see what else is posted and and then maybe post for the one that's most interesting to you that you think is the, is the best match. Um, I feel like General rule of thumb, applying for two or three similar positions is okay, but beyond that, it starts to look like you don't have a, I think it can be interpreted as a sense of um, either desperation or that you are not thinking thinking carefully about which job you're the best fit for, which is not to say you, a lot of you who have 
really interesting experience and maybe varied experience could position yourself for several different jobs within a company and probably do them really well. But that's not always the way HR looks at it. You know, they tend to look or whoever's first looking, the hiring manager or whoever, um, you know, they're going to look at it in terms of, um, you know, they want you to have given some thought to, is it a good fit for you? So I would say, you know, don't apply to six things simultaneously. You know, if there's a bunch of jobs posted that you're interested in at the same company, you know, think through carefully which one or two are you really interested in and can make a, a solid case and then leave it at that. And then, you know, keep an eye out because something might, might come up in a, a couple of weeks or, or later, you know, or a month or so later that you might really also want to apply to. But um, yeah, so yes, but don't, don't apply to too many. Um, what's my contact info? So cshin at barnard.edu um, is uh, the best way to reach out to me. Um, and um, uh, you also can connect to me on LinkedIn. Uh, I think I'm actually behind in answering some of my connection requests. Um, I'm Christine Valenza Shin there. Um, so those are the two best ways. Um, if you uh, there is a, a, a Barnard phone number that's being, we're not back in the office yet, but 212-854-2033. Uh, you can reach out and uh, they can get a message to me, but I would say email cshin at barnard.edu. Can Barnard's participation in Handshake be customized so that our graduation year isn't visible to potential employers? I don't share that on my resume or LinkedIn, so I had to work with your office to have my account deleted once I learned that the info is visible. That's an interesting question. I'm going to have to make a note and find out about that. Um, so I'm noting your name and I'm just writing down handshake and class year. I think it is. I feel like I've seen that. Like when I've had appointments with alumni, there are some who do not put their class year. So yeah, let me look into that and, um, and get back to you on that. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then if that if you can't currently do it, uh, we also can uh, reach out to Handshake directly and ask them for that option. So, um, so good question, and I will have to follow up on that one. Um, I'm starting a new job where I'm going to be organized other NGOs to work together. Are there any books or training materials you can recommend for this work? Hmm. Another good question. Don't not off the top of my head. Um, but that's actually would be great if anybody in the chat section wants to answer that question. So just to reiterate it, starting a new job where I'm going to be organizing other NGOs to work together. Are there any books or training materials you can recommend for this work? So please feel free to add any suggestions to the chat. That would be great. And I'll, I'll think on that as well and, um, and, uh, and let you know um, if I come up with anything. And then that's also a great, Question, if you want to do a quick LinkedIn search of Barnard alumni, you know, working in the NGO sector, you know, you might be able to, to get some suggestions from there as well. If you're pursuing multiple paths, what do you tell people when you're networking? If the person is trying to help is looking to introduce you, but not confined to one area. Yeah, I think I gave a script for this. I forget which session, but we've been working with this on students, which is, again, striking that balance between I'm focused on this, but I'm open to that, which is better than saying, I only want this, or I'm open to anything. Open to anything is really tricky in a networking situation. It's hard for the networker to, on the one level, they don't always take you completely seriously. And on the other, um, it's so broad, it's so, it's so broad that they can't really help you. So our general script is, um, when you're meeting with somebody or when you're reaching out, is saying, I'm exploring options in, you know, job sector X, but I'm also open to, and then you suggest one, possibly two other things. And so what that shows is you have a focus, but you also have some flexibility. We're at the five minute mark. I have a hard stop, need to get to my staff meeting right at two. So I'll do as many more as I can. Between finding something I'm in, interested in and retargeting my letter and resume, I feel like I haven't applied for more than one or two jobs per day. Am I moving too slowly? No. I think that's fine. Um, unless, I mean, if you're seeing absolutely reams and reams of things that you're not getting to, you could maybe pick up the pace. But I think I 
probably have said this a couple different times, quality over quantity. Um, so taking the time to target your letter, target your resume is, you know, putting together a quality application is going to take you a lot further than, um, um, than just churning them out. Um, so there was an interesting addendum to some of the research about women and men and job, um, uh, job descriptions, which is that because women uh, tend to take themselves out of the running and don't apply to as many, they do tend to do a better job applying. And so they have a higher percentage rate of getting interviews. I don't know how big a study it was, but I thought that was an interesting variation on quality over quantity. Um, so, um, Great, and that seems to be the end of the questions in the Q&A section. So let's do that and then let's see uh, what we've got. Okay, good. We've got some of the, some suggestions on the NGOs. Thank you. Um, thank you. I got a nice note about motivating at a time where so many people are in limbo. Yeah. Um, yeah, that kind of is a, in a nutshell. Thank you for saying that is sort of the impulse behind um, the summer colloquium and of course running, you know, this specific series, uh, which we used to run more frequently and probably will run more frequently. I, I think it will probably rerun this in January. Who knows where we'll be at that point. So, um, but yeah, thank you for, thank you for that feedback. It's nice to hear. And, and I do encourage you if you all could take a, when you do get a survey from Beyond Barnard, um, the more concrete feedback you can give us, the better just in terms of future planning and also just, uh, you know, just giving us a sense of, of what went well and what could be better about some of the colloquium and some of these other other things so um all right i'm having trouble scrolling back up in the chat so as usual i will lean on uh lacy to let me know if there was anything um, that i need to respond to Oh, interesting. Oh, here's another one. Do you think the green open to work frame for your photo on LinkedIn makes you look desperate? No, I think I, I, especially my understanding without having fully explored it is that it's only it only recruit only people with an official recruiter, what's called a recruiter seat on LinkedIn will be able to see it. So that those are recruiters and HR people and managers who have paid my understanding is quite a bit more money to LinkedIn to get a recruiter seat. And so those are the only people who are going to be looking and I'm going to guess that they can filter by that. And so anything that helps you get into a recruiter's filter, I think can be helpful. So, um, great. Okay. So, I'm going to leave it there. Um, thank Lacey again and thank all of you for tuning in, for asking great questions, for giving suggestions to each other. And, um, and you know, just keep your eye on your mail. We will be, as I said, we you received, you should have received, if you're on Barnard's uh, mailing list, a solicitation to become a mentor or a panelist or all sorts of opportunities that we have for you all to continue supporting our students and recent grads. Um, but then towards the end of August, you should start getting some emails about other programming, not just from Beyond Barnard, but from alumni relations in general. So please join us for future programming and uh, keep in touch. Let us know how things are going. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great rest of the summer and we'll talk soon one way or the other. <laughs>